Okay, welcome everybody to Photo Technology Lecture Number 31. We're uh, really pleased today to have uh, Paul Hubel. He's the Chief Image Scientist at Fovion. He got his education uh, undergraduate in optics at University of Rochester, <laughs> grad school at Oxford, and uh, postdoc at MIT Media Labs before going off to HP Labs for 10 years. For the last five years, he's been at Fovion, where I had the, the pleasure to spend some of those years working with him. He's uh, responsible for the color balancing and other uh, image processing algorithms and at least three brands of cameras that I know about. So he's going to tell us some of, the, some of the tricks of that business and why it's interesting. Paul, take it away. Thank you. So is this working? You can hear me? Yep. You can hear me in Santa Monica or wherever you are? Um, so OK, so um, thanks, Dick. So I'm going to talk about white balance today, or color balance. Um, I'm not going to talk specifically about Fovion technology or, or anything of that nature. If you're curious about that, just uh, buy Dick a cup of coffee or something like that. He can tell you all about it. Um, and I'm going to talk mainly about color balance in uh, image capture. If I was going to talk about color balance in projection displays, I'd point out that we have two completely different white points of the two projectors here. Um, I don't know if that's intentional or not, but um, so just an overview. Color balance problem, there's a couple different kinds of what we call white point. And <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk about what the distinctions are between those. I'll talk about, there's, so this white point color balance, color constancy, illuminant estimation, they all mean slightly different things. And they're all useful for slightly different things. So I'll try to distinguish between them and talk about what the differences are. I'll outline the problem that um, specific to our application, which is photography, um, and talk about some of, the, some of the methods that are used. I'll explain some of the basic methods, like gray world. And I'll talk about some of the more advanced method, methods, um, you know, going, going through a bunch of, a bunch of different methods. Uh, adding more and more complexity as we go along. <clears throat> then I'll talk about some hard situations, specifically some work that I did in the past on, on uh, dawn and dusk scenes, sunset scenes, which are one of the uh, most interesting. Um, and then I'll talk, uh, talk, finally, at the end, talk about methods of testing these algorithms. So let's see. Adapted white point and adopted white point. So this is, this is an important distinction um, between different kinds of, <clears throat> this is actually cropped from a standard, so there's a U in color in, uh, in some situations. Sometimes there isn't a U, I apologize. Um, so adapted white point is the color stimulus that an observer who's adapted to the viewing environment would judge to be perfectly achromatic. So this is what, sort of like what our brain sees as neutral in the scene. That's the way I think of it. It's, it's what the, the visual system has adapted to in the scene. The adopted white point is what a camera or some kind of device is adapting, uh, adopting from the scene and, and neutralizing the picture to. So ideally, in photography, you want adopted to equal adapted. And so I, I, it's, it's kind of confusing, but it, basically it's what the machine does versus what the visual system is doing. Unfortunately, we don't know what the visual system is doing, except by asking observers and things like that. There is no, you know, there's no uh, uh, synapse that you can probe to try to figure out what is white. It's something that there's a lot of research done on that, and there's a lot of theories, but we really don't know the mechanisms of how these things really work. So color constancy comes about and says a camera records different colors depending on the scene illuminant. So obviously we have uh, daylight, two flavors of daylight, tungsten and fluorescent. And the camera sees those all as different. You know, the, the tungsten is going to be yellowish, the D65 is going to be bluish, and fluorescent comes out slightly greenish. Our, our visual system somewhat sees these things uh, as neutral regardless of the illumination. So I'll have more on that later, because it isn't quite true. But to first approximation, it is. So what the illuminant estimation problem is, 
is that you have the raw camera data. From that raw data, you try to estimate the illuminant. From that estimate of the illuminant, you try to put that into the camera pipeline, into your rendering model, in order to get an image that comes out neutral and doesn't come out yellow. So this is something that all digital cameras do. Analog cameras used to do it with their choice of film, and the photo finishing systems also, also do them. Um, unfortunately, sometimes, uh, you know, especially in the early days of digital photography, the, the ability to do this hurt rather than helped. There were a lot of times where it just screwed it up, and you'd end up getting a worse result than you would have if you had taken it with film. So the ability and, and the, the, the sort of digital capabilities was hurting things in the beginning because it you know, wasn't doing a very good job. So one thing that's important is to look at possible scene illuminance. And so this is a diagram. This is a chromaticity diagram. So we're looking at um, red over green channel uh, against the blue over green channel. And the axes are not really important. I'm just saying it's a chromaticity diagram. It's a two-dimensional cross-section of, of color space. And here you can see different illuminants. There's tungstens down here. Uh, D120 would be up here. That would be a shade. And from, from there, you can see a kind of a, you can make a line, sort of a curved line. And that is the uh, Planck radiator and then the daylight locus. And then off to the side here are where the fluorescent lights would appear in this particular camera system. So our, the red over green, uh, blue over green is defined by the camera system itself. It's not necessarily a visual visual system. Um, how do images change with illumination? If you have a patch in under one illuminant and a patch under another illuminant, and then the, another patch under one versus the other, they change basically by these, these factors, um, alpha, beta, and gamma. And as a, so as the illuminant changes, image R, G, and B change by three independent scale factors. So this is what we call the um, diagonal model of illuminant change. And it's, it's approximate, and it, but it usually works. It depends on, the, on a number of factors, like the spectral sensitivities and the specific color space. And in fact, in most of these situations, you do this uh, white point correction in a different color space than the original data. So you go through a linear transformation to get into a, a space where you do the, the um, the diagonal correction, and then you go back out. You, so this is what's invented about 100 years ago by von Kries, um, and it's still in use, use today, and it's one of the most uh, uh, important things. So if you try to do a diagonal correction um, in just in raw camera space, it would, the, the quality of the, of, the, of the white point adjustment would vary dependent on the camera. Um, in our camera, the Fovion camera where the spectral sensitivities are broad, it doesn't work at all. Um, in something where you've got sharper, spectrally sharper sensitivities, it, it works okay. Um, but in all of them, they do better by doing this, uh, going into this different color space. So implications of the model, um, we simply need to recover these three values uh, to take uh, the, the illuminant from one illuminant to, to the reference light. And usually that's sRGB, which is D65, um, for, the mo for almost, almost all applications these days. So we want to go from the, the uh, scene illuminant to, this, to, to sRGB. Um, equivalently, we just, one, so one way can, we can do it is we just need to determine the R, G, and B value for some reference surface in the scene, or a white patch, under the unknown light, so that there are the, or the scene white point. In fact, it's usually enough to estimate a 2D um, position, so this, in this chromaticity space, if you can determine the chromaticity of, or, or the color of, that, of the white point in the scene, that's enough to get you where you need to go um, in terms of color balance. Now, white balance or um, white balance can also include intensity balance and tone adjustment. And I'm not going to talk about that today. It's a fixed step that's usually controlled by exposure and the tone curve that's used. So, um, and that, that can depend a lot on how bright 
or how dark, or how dim the white point is. We're really just going to be talking about the color, color balance properties of the white. Um, so why is it hard? Um, let's look at what we know when we get data from a scene and what we don't know. We know the RGB values of, of all the surfaces in the scene. Um, we don't know the color of these surfaces. We don't know their RGB values and under the reference light that we're trying to transform to. We don't know the color of the scene illuminant. And so we have more unknowns than we have known. So this is the, the basic problem. We don't, we don't have enough information if you take it in a sim simple way. So we can't uniquely identify the scene illuminant without making additional assumptions about the scene and the camera. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to interrupt me or just, you know, feel free. Um, try to keep this less formal. Uh, some white balance approaches. So I'm not going to go through all these, but these are a few of the major milestones in the, the literature of, of white balance. Um, gray world, which I'll talk about first, is the, the most basic. Max RGB, which is often attributed to, to Edwin Land, but I'm sure it was done before that. It's part of Land's Retinex model, which is much more complicated than just taking the maximum of the scene. Um, Minkowski spectral models uh, are trying to Take some make some assumptions about dimensionality of the spectra of the surfaces and the illuminance. Um, let's see, what else? We'll talk a little bit about constrained gray world. Uh, and then getting down into these models, we'll, we'll talk about some of those towards the end. Um, specifically, some of the gamut-based and probabilistic approaches, which uh, have, been, have been quite successful. And these, these basically increase in complexity and constraints, and also in performance, in, in mildly. I mean, it's not, um, performance is very hard to measure because some of the more complicated methods can do very well with very hard scenes. Some of the simple methods can do very well with some of the very easy scenes, but it's not necessarily uh, vice versa. One key thing is that the methods up at the top don't need any calibration. And if you're working on really inexpensive cameras where you're making um, upwards, it's, it's getting upwards towards a billion a year cell phone cameras that are going to be generated by the end of this decade. I mean, think about it, a billion a year. It's just mind boggling. There's no way you can calibrate them. It just takes too long. Even the second it would take to flash one picture is often not done in these really cheap cameras. So, you have to rely more on uncalibrated sensors. Um, as a result, you don't get as good performance in terms of the color balance. As you can add more and more calibration, getting up towards digital SLRs like uh, the Sigma camera that uses our sensor, those you can spend a fair amount of time being really sure that every camera works as it's performed. So that color space that I showed before is anchored correctly. You know you know where illuminant A is specifically for that camera really accurately because you have it well calibrated. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the gamut mapping and the probabilistic approaches down at the bottom of that list um, are, are well justified in terms of theory. Um, some uh, comparisons that have been done at a few universities suggest that these are the best performing. Also, some of the cameras that use these methods tend to do quite well in terms of uh, comparisons in the, in the industry. Um, however, good performance is a lot of good engineering as well as good theory. So you can have a good theory of how to do your white balance, but if you don't calibrate well or if you don't, uh, if you don't figure the system out and go through all the details, it, it, it's never going to work all that well. And there's a big gap between you know, the theoretical literature and explaining how something's done to actually putting something in a camera and getting it to work well. So the combination of the good theory and the good engineering ought to give the best results. So let's start with the gray world. Um, gray world simply says that if you take the mean of the, of the data coming in from the camera and you set that to gray, then under a different 
uh, colored light, the scene average will change by the three independent scale factors, factors that we showed before. And if you take the mean of, the, of a, the image under a different light, you can scale by those scale factors and end up neutralizing the image. So basically, if the world is gray, then this system works perfectly. So if you're taking a picture of a whiteboard or a gray piece of paper or something where the average of the scene that you're taking a picture of is neutral, then this, this, uh, this system works, works perfectly. However, of course, that's, that's never quite the case, unless you're taking a picture of a whiteboard. And I came up with this really complicated algorithm at HP, and someone took a picture of a, of a whiteboard, and it just it didn't work. <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing, because here we are comparing it to the most basic algorithm, and it failed. So it's, it's a, yeah, questions? You could improve on this by having a, a wide spectral sensor that averages the spectrum for the whole image. If you had a spectrum for the whole image and the RGB values for all the pixels, it seems like you could always recover the one. Say that again. You, okay. you, you have a sensor that has a wide spectrum, but then you, then you get one value. You don't. Yeah, exactly. I want, in addition to the camera, I want on a beam splitter, I want a, a, a Oh, yeah, sure, you can put in extra, extra sensors into the device, and some early cameras, the very high-end cameras, actually do have special white point sensors. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Sure, yeah, you could do that. Um, in commercial photography, it's too expensive. I mean, it's to put an extra system in, except on the very highest-end cameras, um, it's not a practical situation. For other reasons, it doesn't work as well, because when you're measuring that, usually you have a diffuser in front of, the, of the, the thing that's measuring that white point. You get the light that's incident on the camera coming down onto the camera, not necessarily the light in the scene. So if you have a telephoto lens and you're looking at something half a mile away, you're not balancing for the white point of that scene. You're balancing for the white point of the light coming in. You, you're right, you could put a beam splitter in and have an extra spectral, but then you need a spectral sensor. You couldn't just use a broad sensor. Uh, but you need more than one. You need more than one value. Yeah. You need 31 values to measure the spectrum. Well, maybe according to Brian Wandel, five or six is good. Uh, sure. Uh, fluorescent lights have 12 basis functions. They're spiky. They don't. It doesn't work. The 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 the, the spectral uh, decomposition of light sources. You need a lot of basis functions to really be able to determine the luminant accurately, especially a fluorescent light. Yeah. The basis of the suggestion is still using the gray world model. No, the basis of the suggestion is that I want to know what the color is instead of gray that's the average of the whole scene. If I know that, then I can always recover the image. No? What? What? So, uh, I mean, the idea is that if you, so if we go back. If I knew it was yellow instead of gray, and I knew what shade of yellow, then I could recover the scene, right? Not exactly. And I'll, I'll get to that later on at the, towards the end of the talk, especially there are some situations where it, it simply doesn't work. That if you measure spectrally what the, the illuminant is and you try to correct the picture, it looks wrong. I'll give you an example at the end. It's a, it's a good question, though. So, but that's one thing. I mean, we don't have spectrophotometers coming out of our foreheads. The visual system doesn't measure the spectral characteristics of the illumination. We do, we do, we take the, the, all the, the signals like a camera, we take this information and our visual system is actually making an estimate of the illuminant. So, and that's what we're trying to mimic. We're trying to mimic what the visual system is doing. Not, we're not trying to recreate, um, we're not trying to reproduce spectra. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that and I'll give an example of that later on. Um, okay, so we go through the steps. I don't need to talk about that. We're just, so we're just taking the average. So here's an example. We have raw data. Um, so this is a raw image under a bluish colored daylight. And this is the properly corrected image. This is if I do actually measure the spectra and do the correction. And this is what we get under gray world. So here, this is standard failure situation where you take something like a poinsettia. Poinsettias are really hard um, for lots of different algorithms, not just white points. You go work on demosaicing or something like that, they, go, they give all kinds of fits. Um, 
to never make a, a camera around this time of year. So the, um, so the gray world here, you can see it's turning the, the, the background color green because what's happening is that the average of the scene is no longer gray. Here it is gray, here it's grayer, and here it's not gray. So as you can see, as you add the, the red poinsettia into the scene, it, it throws the algorithm off. So the classic, um, the classic example of this is the baby on the red rug, it's called. So here you have a picture of a baby, newborn baby on a red rug. Um, if you take the average of the scene and balance it, the baby turns green or goes kind of jaundice in some situations. And of course, it's a classic failure and something you really want to avoid. And I actually had this happen. It wasn't on a red rug. It was on some purple IKEA toys. Um, he's now 10, so this was a while ago. Um, but it's a great example of how, you know, in, in this camera, I took, took the picture and let the algorithm go on its own on a, on a similar camera, I had the raw data, and I could run it through a more complicated algorithm to get the right answer. So here's a, the, the, just the classic kind of gray world failure problem. Um, so the, the next, next approach would be to take the maximum of the, of the scene and set that equal to white, also called the white patch. If you have a white patch in the scene and it is the maximum, then you can correct that. And it's popular in video systems. Um, so you're just replacing the mean that we used before with the maximum. Uh, it assumes that none of the channels are saturating or anything like that. Um, and it works reasonably well, um, but it gives problems if the brightest objects aren't white. So often you'll get a, a yellowish surface or a fluorescent color or something like that that are brighter than white. You know, if you washed your clothes in, in Tide, the uh, max RGB algorithm doesn't work quite so well. This uh, Minkowski norm technique is, is, a, is a pretty cool um, theoretical work. Um, and what that does is basically it's, it goes between the mean and the maximum. And the, uh, if you look at the Minkowski norm and you take the uh, uh, p is equal to 1 in, in, the, in the Minkowski norm uh, mathematics, that gives you exactly the mean of the scene. And if you go to, to infinity, where you're, so you're putting the data to the infinite power and, and um, doing the infinite root of it, you get the maximum. And you can do, there's a family of, um, of properties in between. And the, some work done in England found that for some reason, at least in the data, if you use the sixth root, you get the best results, at least for that particular data set. We found that something between cube, cube root works, works better than the mean and works better than the maximum. Kind of gives you something in between these two things. But you're still, you're still, um, you're still gonna get situations where it doesn't work. You're still gonna get statistical situations where the image just doesn't look right. And so then, so now we're gonna put forward some some smarter algorithms, and these, um, so these simple assumptions for gray world max RGB and the, all the things in between simply don't hold for some images. Um, so uh, one, one thing is that for some scene estimates, the, some scenes, the estimate of the scene illuminant that you'd use isn't even realistic. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a sec. Um, in fact, the, the range of illuminance that you see is quite restricted. And this is what we refer to as an illumination constraint. So if you take this chromaticity space and you look at um, the illuminance, A, D65, all the different ones that you might see in a scene. Um, so the, the squares are standard sources, the dots here are various measured lights, so we went around and measured a whole bunch of different lights, um, and they're, they're clustered around in there. Now this, this forms a set, and um, so it's useful when you're doing any of these algorithms to make sure that the answer that you get at least lies inside that, that polygon. So what we can do is you can take the gray world, the simple gray world algorithm, get the result of that, 
Now, in this kind of situation, where you, specifically where you have a failure, what can happen is that your estimate is not an illuminant. It's not possible. It's not physically possible. So what you can do is you can just kind of map that in, into the illuminant uh, polygon. So you're constraining your answer to possible illuminants. And this helps. This helps quite a lot. Um, so these are the same pictures, but here we've constrained the illuminant. You still don't get quite the right answer, but it's a lot better than the results I showed before. So here we're just kind of pushing it into that, into that polygon. Additional constraints, well, one, um, one thing that you can do is you can say, um, you can try to predict something about the scene. So all, all possible lights are here. All possible results under shade conditions might be this uh, green polygon. And under bright conditions might be this blue polygon. One, one interesting fact is that the sun is a lot more powerful than any illuminant we know. So if you're under sunlight, you're usually around D53, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, regularly. I mean, it's uh, even, even late in the day or really early in the morning, you've got a lot less light than you do at noon. So if you've got that really strong signal, if your BV value from your camera is really powerful, you can constrain down to this pretty small polygon. And just from that, you can get a pretty good result. So there are tricks you can play with this kind of thing. And this helps a lot. So on to the next. Um, so this blue is kind of, I guess you can see it better over here. So, so the next, the next uh, level of complexity that I'll add here is that um, instead of just looking at the average value or the maximum value or some basic value, we're going to take a histogram of color space. So here we've just binned it. We've got eight bins in either dimension. And we're looking at um, how often a particular chromaticity occurs in the image. And unfortunately, you can't see it that well on this. Uh, this projection, but you can see value. There are some values in here, so there are a few colors in the test image that occur in this chromaticity. There are a couple, couple colors that occur a lot, and a few more up here that don't occur very often. So basically, by using this histogram, we can avoid some of the gray world problems. And actually, there's a little cross here, which is so. Once you get this histogram, you can take statistics. You can take a centroid, or you can do all kinds of different kind of um, statistical calculations to give yourself an answer. Um, and so that's the particular answer that, that a centroid calculation would give you in this case. Um, you can weight that histogram. So you can say to yourself, OK, colors in the center of this histogram, which I know are neutral because I've calibrated the camera, I find more important than the others. I think that neutral colors are telling me more about the illuminant in the scene, so I'm going to consider them more. So I take this and I just multiply it by some kind of distribution, Gaussian distribution or something like that, and use that to help you with this answer. So it, it helps you avoid outliers out here because you're not counting them as much. So in this kind of algorithm, these saturated colors are not contributing as much to the answer as the neutral colors. And this, this, uh, this improves. It's still basically a gray world, but it improves on it a lot. Because it's, it's, um, if, uh, if you have a single surface that, that is uh, contributing a lot, it's not, it's not weighted as highly as something that's neutral. Um, another example is to go, to go to a binary histogram. So, here we're just asking the question, is the color in the image or not? And so this, this, here we ignore the problems of gray world completely. We ignore the fact that there's a lot of contribution from, uh, from um, one particular surface, and maybe a lot from another surface. We're saying that, OK, the image has all of these colors in it. Therefore, they're all possible. So I want to make my estimate just from that information. And if you take a convex hull of this binary histogram, you have what we call a, a gamut of the image. So you, you get your image in, 
you find your colors that are, exist, you take your convex hull, and that determines the gamut of the picture that's coming in. And from that gamut, you can do some tricks to try to figure out um, what the illuminant is. So, uh, so we want to, so th this is this, um, this so-called gamut mapping techniques um, for, for illuminant estimation. And just explaining that, if you, so again, we're still in the similar color space, chromaticity space. If you have an image taken under a bluer light, D65 or D80 or something, you get a certain gamut corresponding to that. If you take a picture under tungsten, you get a different gamut. So the same surfaces just under a different illuminant, the gamut shifts from one position to another. So if you take, uh, so what you can do is you can do a little test of consistency. So if you have, say, say you're calibrating your camera with these surfaces, you know where these gamuts are, and a test color comes in, this color, one here, is consistent, it's not consistent with your daylight gamut, but it's consistent with your, um, sorry, it is consistent with the daylight, it's not consistent with tungsten. If you had another surface, this surface is consistent with either of those illuminants. And this third one is consistent only with the tungsten, not with daylight. So if you get an image coming in with these two colors, it's consistent, both of those colors are consistent with tungsten, but only the second, second patch is consistent with, um, with daylight. So for both of these colors to exist under the same illuminant, in this simple case, it has to be tungsten. So that's, that's how you know to choose tungsten, because both of these surfaces are consistent with the gamut of tungsten. So this is what's led to this uh, color by correlation method. Basically what we do is we take a set of reference surfaces under an illuminant, we take the convex hull of those surfaces, and then we just make a binary um, uh, correlation vector a binary vector corresponding to whether those colors inside that convex hull exist or not. So ones where it exists, zeros. So we're just rasterizing that space, putting ones where we have the colored surfaces and zeros where we don't. So we do this for a whole bunch of different illuminants. So here we have eight different illuminants. Each one is going to give you a slightly different polygon. And so each one of these vectors is going to correspond to a different illuminant. So once we build this correlation matrix, and we do this when we calibrate the camera, then we get, and we take our picture. So we've built the camera, we've built the correlation matrix, put it in the, in the memory of the camera. Then along comes a, a picture. We take a picture of that. Then we just take that image vector, rasterized in the same way, multiply it by the correlation matrix, M. So we just do the, the calculation. And in this simple case, we just get a whole bunch of numbers that corresponds to the consistency of this data with these different illuminants. So we can see the illuminant two in this case is the most consistent with the image that comes through. So we use that as our estimate of the illuminant. So again, we have the image data coming through. Our ones and zeros, your correlation table, you, you, you do the calculation of the correlation matrix, you do a threshold to determine what's the most uh, consistent. Instead of using a binary histogram, you could use likelihoods or other statistics. So in that case, under the likelihoods, here you've got what, what surfaces are most likely under all the different illuminants. And here, instead of just having binary numbers, you've got uh, a more complicated correlation table. And you end up with with, again, you have a, an illuminant with your threshold that's the, the most likely to have been the illuminant of the scene. So this is an example of a typical gray world failure kind of a scene. And here you can see the max RGB case has probably taken her forehead and treated that as the illuminant. So her face kind of goes a little bit gray. And the, 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 um, the green gets you this kind of chemlon look to it, um, whereas the correlation gives you 
uh, something more closely related to the perfect result, the perfect result being a spectral measurement of the scene corrected perfectly. Um, so this is just an example of that. Uh, that, that was binary. Um, so these, these are very well justified theoretically. Um, they perform well. One interesting point is that saturated colors help a lot. If you have a really saturated red in the scene, you know that the light source could not have been really blue. On the, on the same token, if you, have a, if you have a scene coming through for a blue chair and you get a really strong blue chromaticity from your camera, you know it cannot possibly have been taken under tungsten. It's just physically impossible. So those saturated colors are what help you. Um, again, these methods can fail on very simple scenes like, like a whiteboard. Yeah? It seems like the simpler the scene, the more catastrophically any method can fail. If you have just a single color in your image, then everything fails, right? So you should be able to quantify the, the confidence that you have in a color correction using these methods. How much, um, how much color information is in the picture? Yeah, you, you can do that. In fact, in fact, that's a good way there. The, so when I talk about good engineering and what actually goes inside a camera, usually what happens is there's a lot of different methods and you produce a lot of different answers, potential answers, and you look at statistics of the scene to see, for example, how saturated, what's your distribution of colors. Because um, your, this, this algorithm works better with satur with, when you have a large distribution of color. So you're right. I mean, it's um, for sure. But there are still going to be situations where you get a strong dominant color in the background. And if you were to use a, a simpler algorithm, it's, it's going to fail. But if you ha just have, so hey, say you have completely red background and you just have one or two other colors in there, just tiny little things in the center. An algorithm like this can get the, get the right answer, get a lot closer to the right answer than just take, doing a simple statistical algorithm. Um, flash. So flash is a, um, an idea, interesting idea that came along. Um, and in fact, going back many years ago, this is actually what got me started on this work at the beginning, because Canon has a patent that says that if the flash fires, you can't use that information to correct the color of the image. So I had to try to work around that patent, and that's got me started on it in the right in the beginning. Um, but you know, aside from you know, there are a lot of patents in this in this field, and but we won't worry ourselves with that at the moment. But one so the interesting thing is, did the flash fire? You know, you can you can answer that easily electronically. Look at the metadata of the, of the file and see if the flash fired. Um, you know that their flash obviously uh, often has variable strength. You can tell how, f how, how, um, how much voltage was applied to the flash, and that can actually give you different flash colors. What's the focus distance, right? If you're at infinity and the flash fires, it doesn't do you much good. But if you're at 10 feet and the flash fires, you can do pretty well just with that information without going to anything else, just correct for the color of the flash. Um, this flash no flash pairs um, is an interesting idea that came along. And so here you have um, the idea is that you take an image with the flash, and you, you take an image without the flash. And you subtract the, the first image, the image with the flash, to get the ambient light. So you have a, an image taken with the flash, an image taken without the flash. So the image with the flash has both a mixture of the flash illumination and the ambient. And then you take a picture under the ambient, subtract them, and you end up with an image of just under the ambient. So you can determine, do a pretty good job of determining the illuminant color by using that. And this is some work done at Stanford where they, they did that. They take a pure ambient image and an image with both the flash and the ambient, and they can get a pretty good estimate of the spectral sensitive, the, the spectral, um, this is going through a, a surface reflectance model to determine the, the spectral powder distribution of the illuminant from this kind of flash no flash pair. So, color constancy. Um, color constancy at the extreme 
gives us surface color. So it's like mapping spectral signals from a single point in the scene to color. Now, um, color constancy, uh, so if you assume that the visual system is color constant, that is what I've said so far is true, that the visual system balances the, um, that the ambient, the adopted equals the adapted, that you balance completely for the color of the light coming through, then color constancy is valid, and really what your, our visual system is recovering is surface color, right? You're, you're compensating for the spectral power distri distribution of the illuminant, and you look at a scene, and no matter what the color of the light is, everything neutral is neutral. They're all exactly the same. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't, doesn't hold true, because you, you have situations where you have multiple illuminants, and they don't look the same. Um, so this begs this question, is color perception color constant? And uh, oh, this is, this is an example of an advanced algorithm done at uh, Simon Fraser University, where they're actually balancing different parts of the image for different illuminants. So here, this is the, the raw data, this is uh, one correction method, another global correction method, and then this, this is a, a correction method where they correct differently for one part of the image than they do for another. And so as a result, if you're trying, if you've got a machine vision problem where you're trying to determine surface color, surface reflectance, or surface color, this works really well because you're getting rid of the effects of the illumination. Now unfortunately, aesthetically, it doesn't look like the perception. If you look around this scene and all these different illuminants, they all look a little bit different. Some are more yellow than others. Some are, some are bluer. Some are even greener. The greener you can't see quite as well, but certainly between blue and yellow, they all look different. Some are warmer than others. They may not look yellow, but they're warm, right? So, uh, okay, so this is, this is, so this is the interesting uh, sunset case I want to talk about. So here's a scene taken under tungsten illumination. If you measure the spectral power distribution of the source, it looks like that. It's 2,800 Kelvin, something like that. And if you balance that image for that color of the source, you get it looking, looking pretty good, like, like the scene looked when the picture was taken. So here you're compensating, you're correcting the image for the color of the illumination, and everything's, everything's great, everything's happy. This scene, taken under sunset illumination, if you measure the spectral power distribution of that source, it's very similar to the other one under tungsten. But, now depending on the monitor, this may look pretty bad. Because here we're balancing for the color of the illumination, just as we did in the previous image, but the image looks blue. It looks terrible. Why? So if you look at the spectral power distribution of these two light sources, they're almost exactly the same. Not only that, they have almost exactly the same color temperature. Any ideas? So under tungsten, we need to correct for the illumination color. But under sunset, we don't want to correct for the illumination color. So is the visual system corrects for tungsten, not sunsets? It's kind of weird. So the answer is in the shadows. The illuminator on the left balance for the illuminant color, and here, we, um, here we're balancing for the illuminant estimate, not the illuminant color. So this one's measured with a spectrophotometer. This one is going through one of these algorithms that estimates the illuminant. Here it looks, it looks like you'd want it to look, like the, you'd want the photograph to be, like the scene looked when I saw it when we, when we took the picture. On the left, it looks way too blue. Now the issue is that this is actually two illuminants. You've got the direct illumination from the sun at, on the horizon, which is a very low color temperature, but you've also got the illumination in the shadows, which because of Rayleigh scattering is very blue at that time of day. So you've got these two completely different colors of illumination illuminating the scene. And if you were to take the maximum or the mean, you would basically be ignoring the shadow light. And it turns out that the shadow light is really very important in these kinds of um, scenes, because we adapt to the shadow light 
it, it gives a lot of indication, a lot of clues into our visual system about where, where we want to put color balance. So basically, the estimate in this case is better than the measurement. Because the estimate considers the direct illumination and the shadows, not just the direct illumination itself. Um, so we're using both the direct illumination and the shadows. Any scheme that assumes a single illumination measurement will fail in these kinds of situations. Now the key here is that photographers get up early in the morning to take these pictures. And if you make them neutral, they're not going to be happy. You, can't take, you don't want to take away that warm character of the picture. And this happened a lot in the early days of digital photography. You'd get a camera, people would take pictures of the sunset, it would look cold and horrible. And in fact, some companies even went back and said, we're not going to estimate the illuminate at all. Using the camera sensors, right? Whereas yeah. the spectral computation is using a real spectrum. Correct. So yeah. Would it be instructive to superimpose the primaries of the camera sensors on those uh, graphs? Because I could easily see how you could get a very distorted estimate in three primaries if the spectrum has those big spikes in it, like the sunset. Uh, potentially, but, but you still, even, even if you do do that, you, you'd still get, if you just considered the direct illumination and looked at the chromaticity of the camera, if you, if you just balanced the camera to that data from the direct illumination, you'd get the same result. You would still get a cold picture. Deciding what's a shadow and what isn't. That just kind of falls out of the statistics, right? Yeah. But it, the, the important point is that the estimate considers all of those statistics and doesn't limit it to just the dominant ones, just the brightest ones, or a single measurement. I'll, I'll, I'll have, a, I have another example of that coming up. Um, so the interesting thing about the sunset is that it gives this kind of warmth. It also gives an expanded color gamut. If you look, if you remember the first picture, the, 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 the plot I showed earlier of the tungsten gamut and the daylight gamut of the two pictures. So each one of those independently has a certain size to the gamut. But if both those illuminants are in the scene and you take a picture with both of those or you look at the scene that has both of those illuminants, the actual, actual gamut that, that's coming in to the visual system is the whole thing. It's, it's bigger. And that's, you know, I'm just hand waving now, but that to me explains why photographers do take pictures at sunrise and sunset. Because the gamut of the whole experience is larger. The, 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 color, the color's kind of glowing, they're kind of on fire. The reds that you get under sunset are, are, are beautiful because you've got that contrasting blue shadows. Also, the shadows are darker, which um, leads to more dynamic range, which gives you more chroma. Um, so here's, here's the case, sunset scene balanced to, to th the tungsten 3000 Kelvin. And here we have it balanced to 5000. Here it looks like it did. Here it's way too blue. Tungsten scene, studio shot on the other hand. Here we do want to balance it. And if we don't, we get something way too yellow. But again, the the color of the shadows in this scene is this, are the same, usually. The color of the shadows indoors in this kind of low light situation or a tungsten scene are going to be pretty similar to the direct illumination. Because walls and ceilings are usually neutral. So um, here's a scene taken under sunset. And this is going through this correlation algorithm. And let me just go, whoops. So here the estimate is telling us to balance it at D55. If I look at the, just the um, brighter areas, the estimate D45 wins out. If I look at the shadow areas, D75 wins out. But the estimate up at the beginning that's considering everything gives us something in between. And that's, that's the one that actually gives us the better answer. Um, so, Here's something about the, the question of, do we want to balance all of these illuminants out? Do we want to, to balance? Because there's a lot of debate about um, color constancy and whether we want to balance each illuminant independently. 
And my, my point on this is that 100 years of history, we've always had a single white balance in the images that, we, that, we, that are done and in photography. And they, there aren't scenes that just don't work. There aren't many, at least that I know of. Um, and because that works, to me, using a global white balance is, is, works very well, and going to, to locally varying ones doesn't make as much sense. So I'm running out of time, so it's five minutes. So let's see, I'll just go, here's a few examples of, of scenes. These are hard scenes where you've got very blue light from the flash. Um, here's a white point, uh, a gray world failure with a sunset scene. So you've got two illuminants, the sunset and the shade in the background. And you've got a, a large dominant color to one side. Um, again, here's a tricky situation. You've got tungsten light and you've got a monitor. This is where these will throw the maximum algorithms way off because the monitor, you know, is set to D95 or something like that. Gives you fits. Um, testing color balance. So uh, there are, um, I'm in this camera phone image quality standards group. Uh, it's part of the International Imaging Association. And here we do methods of testing white balance. So we have standard methods where we take a color checker and we put next to it a bunch of colored folders. And we use this, we take a bunch of pictures to determine how well, from this you can determine how well the algorithm is, is balancing. You know, we're, we're looking for these kind of gray world failures. So this is, whoop. And uh, yeah, so there's an, an example of that kind of an image that we're trying to mimic. Basically, when you're testing these, nothing, nothing um, helps more than just taking a lot of pictures of a lot of different kinds of scenes. Um, you can do some synthetic tests, like these folder tests, and you can do some quantity, quantitative analysis of this. But you're always going to run into the problems like this sunset problem. So I want to thank uh, Steve Horley, Graham Finlayson, Dick Lyon, Sumit Chavla, Ken Doyle, Pal Paradise, and other colleagues from Foveon and HP over the years. And uh, so here's a final image. And if you just, so this is using sort of a gray world kind of correction, whereas if you do a, a better job of the illuminant, you get the richness of the blue. And also last week, my talk was, um, uh, replaced by this uh, stereo talk, and they, they actually talked about the fact that the, um, uh, as you go further back, the, the atmosphere can make things bluer in the background. So this is a good example of, of that kind of depth cue coming from that. So just linking those two talks to you. So um, that's it. Um, any other questions? Or? Thank you. Uh, so the question is, how much does it vary between humans about what is white? Um, I, I, I don't know. I have never, I've never seen any, um, anything that has, uh, that has discussed differences between what is white. There are obviously differences between color and cone sensitivities and um, color space, uh, preference, there's a lot of difference in preference. Um, but as far as any kind of measured thing, I'm not aware of any. Certainly preference, there are definitely differences. Gary? What's your opinion on seeing content recognition approaches to white balance? Okay, good question. What's, the, what's my opinion of seeing content approaches um, to doing white balance? And, and um, so it, recently, new cameras have come on, come on the market that do face detection and will, can do flesh tone correction. And, and that's, it's, it's exciting. I don't know if it's going to solve, have a better solution to the problem. Um, so I, I'm optimistic that it'll help, for sure. I mean, if you can, if you can use uh, your, the, the fact that there's a face to limit 
the same way you did, uh, we did the illuminant constraint. If you could use that to constrain the possible results to be something that would be within the realm of uh, skin tone colors, then that would be a powerful tool. You gotta be careful because different cultures prefer different skin tones to be rendered different ways. And so there's, you gotta be careful, but I think it, it could be quite helpful. Yeah. You seem to conclude that global correction was the most kind of viable approach, but to me, you strongly suggested that using the gamut method, where you characterize the, the range of colors possible for example, in a daylight scene, that, that it might be useful to separate that in, into two polygons, one for direct illumination and one for the Raleigh scattering. Sure. I, I, definitely. You, so, Ultimately, if you can determine what the color of the illumination was from every point in the scene, it's useful information. Whether, what, I'm, what I'm arguing against is correcting it out of every pixel in the scene. You'd be better off taking that information and choosing something in between. So that, that's my argument. For photography, you know, machine vision is very different, completely different. So, do you have a, yeah? How would these color correction algorithms change if instead of a Fovion RGB array, you had a Bayer array with two different colored greens? Uh, so, um, so the difference between, first the difference between the, the, the Fovion three stacked versus a, a genera, general Bayer, there, the biggest difference is the spectral sensitivity bandwidth. The, Foveon sensors are broader, so the, the correction, the space you need to, the transformation you do into the space is more important, and it's, a, it's um, the broad sensitivities, um, basically, illuminant determination works better the more orthogonal the, the colors are. So you need to do a transformation into something that's sharper. It's more important to do that in the case of the broader sensitivities than it would be in the bare. Now, as far as having two greens that are, that are actually different from each other, which some cameras, um, some newer cameras do, they put it like an emerald in or a white or something like that in place of two greens. That, it gives you more information for sure. They, they don't, the, the, at least Sony's emerald didn't, I don't think helped all that much. Um, but a fourth channel will always give you more information and yeah, for sure. For illuminant determination, it would be helpful to have a, another dimension, for sure. Um, the slight differences that you would get between two greens that are just only very slightly different from each other, um, potentially that could also help because the, the difference between uh, illuminant colors from one illuminant to the next are, are very slight in itself. And actually there's some, I can tell you there's a paper on this chromogenic camera, it's called which uses that kind of uh, idea where you have two slightly different sets of sensitivities. And that's a, it's a very powerful technique and actually gives you much better results. But there you have two different sets of RGBs. You have RGB and then RGB gone that's going through another filter. So you actually have six dimensions coming in. But it gives you more than just what you would gain from the added dimensionality. It's a, it's a, I can show you the reference to that. It's pretty. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.